Conversations Podcast. Hello and welcome to Conversations Interpreting Translating Podcast. Uh, today I'm with a couple of very fine young gentlemen that I met at ISB 14 a couple of months ago. That's the International Symposium of Bilingualism, uh, hosted by Macquarie University in Sydney. And um, I was very, very lucky at the gala dinner to be seated with these wonderful gentlemen. And um, they, they, they opened up my world to something called translanguaging, which we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, and uh, hopefully, you know, just like me, you will be enlightened uh, after listening and or watching this uh, episode. So, Nick, Max, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for, you for the tea. invite. I think you make a wrong choice, okay? Because we're not going to give you something very helpful, but perhaps we're going to give you a trash talk today. <laughs> Trash talk. I love it. All right. You know, um, our podcast is uh, sometimes, you know, along the lines of trash talk, but um, depends on what your trash talk is. Uh, uh, we'll have to wait and see. Um, let's start first about talking about you guys a little bit. Uh, you know, I could I could talk for hours about what you've been doing, but in a nutshell, um, Max, let's start with you. Who is Max Lee? Where are you from? What are you doing? Yeah, uh, so first of all, thank you for inviting us. Um, so my name is Max Lee. I'm currently a lecturer at the uh, Hong Kong Baptist University. And uh, currently, I'm also a PhD student at the University of Hong Kong. And uh, I'm doing this research uh, about translanguage in practice in, in Hong Kong, mainly. Yeah. So you come from a translating interpreting background uh, and you're doing your research on translanguaging, right? Uh, yes, yes. So Fantastic. I'm, I'm, I'm teaching practical translation. In we do have a lot of uh, interpreting and translation practitioners um, as mm -hmm. part of our viewers and listeners. Um, so I yeah. can relate to you very much. Uh, and, and, and Nick, what about you? You're uh, also a lecturer. You lecture in English, right? Mm-hmm. And basically, yeah. in contrast, I do impractical translation in, as a hobby. We'll talk about that because um, basically, I currently, as a lecturer in the Center for Language Education, yes, I teach English to university students at the Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. And uh, basically, my research interest is the same as Max in terms of translanguaging. We also do some kind of similar topics, which is called Kongish, that I will be able to talk about that later on. Why do I say that is an uh, impractical translation? Because one of the interesting features about Kongish is we do some kind of insider direct translations that only people in Hong Kong knows about that. And that actually defeat the purpose of translation, I think, because, um, you know, <laughs> why do we need to translate? Because some people don't understand about that. You don't actually translate because you want to only make it as to people who understand that you translate your term to another group of same group that people understand about that. So basically I would say why I would, my things is more like understanding and doing impractical translations in some way. So it's like keeping it within a close knit community. Sometimes yeah. you don't even want yes. everyone to know about what you're talking about, right? Yeah, exactly. It's almost like, you know, when we were kids, we'd have um, made up languages. Yeah. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Oh, well, there it's you go. The, we're... Other, the other way around. We were onto something when we were kids and now you've turned it into research. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, let's let's step back a little bit. What is translanguaging? I mean, it took you a while for for me to understand, and you had you, we had wine glasses in our hands, and and yes, there there were a few wine glasses in us as well, a few glasses <laughs> of wine. Um, so I, I did really like that uh, of you using the props and bringing it all together. It made sense to me at the time, but that could have been because I, I also may have been drunk a few a few drinks in. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Now, now I'm I'm not a few drinks in, and you don't have wine glasses in front of you, or maybe you do. I don't know. Explain to us and to our viewers and listeners. Oh, just 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 a can. All right, very good. We'll let you take a sip of that. Um, Nick, I'll start with you because you both have different approaches to translanguaging as well. What's translanguaging for you? Basically, I think um, the easiest way to understand, first of all, translanguaging to me and also to people who study that, was see as a way of seeing effective communications. Um, one thing that I think we, with the wine glasses approaches, because, you know, 
basically as a translator or maybe as I was a linguistic student a long time ago, we used to be looking at the language itself. So we study the language, we look at the language structure, we look at the things using language as a center. But then translanguaging is actually trying to help us to look something not just language, but language and something else. Mm. At the same time, we are like shifting our eyes. Instead of looking at one girl, we're now looking at the girl and the parents, right? To, 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 to see how can we effectively engage with not just the single entity, which is language. Because when we look at the communication process, I think as a translator, you're also quite familiar with that. We'll look at not just the outputs itself. We'll also look at who are we translating to and then who am I that would be translating? So that would be looking at the more wider process at the same time. So that's first of all, one thing that make, when you look at translanguaging, you'll see that there is a um, progressive marker, ING, right? To make it as we're looking at the process, not just the, not just the final product itself, but also at the same time, we also quite value on the particular moment that mm. makes some interesting creative, critical practices sometimes when we see. So we will sometimes name these kind of very interesting, creative, critical moment as translanguaging practice, because on that spot, it creates some interesting effects. If we just look at the language itself, we might overlook it. Because as again, as a traditional linguist, why do we find something interesting? Most of the time is because we look at patterns. Maybe out of 100 occurrence, we see that, ah, oh, this seems to be occurring quite often. But then in translanguaging, we don't actually need to look at things that might occur quite a lot. We sometimes would value, even though it's just one time occurrence, because again, pattern is not the thing that we want to see. Of course, it's something that we want to see sometime, but even if it occur only one and only one time, we would pay attention to that because that is also what translanguaging sometimes would try to advocate. We try to make sure not just the common one can be seen, but the special one will not be neglected mm. by social sciences methods sometimes. Mm. Uh, what about you, Max? Do you agree with that? How can you, what, what, what can you add on to translanguaging and its definition? Uh, right, so Nick's explanation is very um, systematic and I especially agree with him, uh, especially the last part, uh, we are looking at uh, the individuals. Um, so if you ask me to, to explain this translanguaging concept, uh, I would say uh, that we, we, we take one person's um, language ability as a whole. And when we are reading these papers about translanguaging, um, well, we, we, often, we, we can often see a phrase that is called um, linguistic repertoire. It means mm. all the language you can speak one person can speak. So if, for example, if I can speak English, Chinese, uh, um, Chinese Mandarin or Cantonese, uh, or some other, uh, language, um, then all these languages are my linguistic repertoire and I can make fully use of all this knowledge on, on these languages and communicate, uh, with others. Um, yeah. Uh, does body language get included in here as well, or that's not a linguistic? Yes, I I, I believe so, because um, th this is what I'm going to say next, because um, in, in, in some examples, I, I took photos of uh, different shop signs that is using uh, what we call translanguaging. Then we are not look, only looking at the text and the meaning of the text, but also, uh, for example, how that logo is designed and how this mm. logo is a, is associated to maybe it's a parody of some famous brand and just they are trying to get you involved. So I believe uh, body language or something you wear on your T-shirt and also be part of this translanguaging. Yeah. I'm looking at um, a definition here by Ophelia Garcia. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Translanguaging is the act performed by bilinguals of accessing different linguistic features or various modes of what are described mm -hmm. as autonomous languages mm -hmm. in order to maximize communicative potential. Mm -hmm. um, so using any language that you have access to, to maximize mm -hmm. your potential to communicate. 
Uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes this can be planned, like you say, it could be used in marketing even. Um, yeah. You know, coming from my own interpreting background, um, especially with people who have been spending, who have spent, you know, 40, 50, 60 years uh, in Australia and, and they've got some bit, bit of Turkish in there, bit of English in there. And if yeah. I speak, if I speak just Turkish, sometimes they don't understand what I'm saying and I have to mix in a little bit of English for mm -hmm. them to understand what I'm saying yeah. um, or, or for them to actually express themselves. They have to mix a little bit of English into Turkish um, and, and, you know, within the, uh, I guess, the, the examining space, the certification testing space and the training space, this is a big no-no. You know, you have to stick <laughs> yeah, to the right. one language. Yeah. Um, this I'm not criticizing anything. I'm just saying this is this yeah, is yeah, the yeah. situation at the moment. You know, when when Nati is testing us, for example, everything has to be in Turkish in accordance with the uh, the Turkish Language Association. Um, but in real life, you know, if we depending on who you're interpreting for, like yeah. just just to give you an example, I was um, interpreting uh, for an aged care assess assessment, and we we're talking to this elderly person about doing exercise and. Um, the, the English speaker, the professional was saying, you know, even going to the shopping center and walking would be exercise. So I interpreted shopping center directly as Alishverish Merkezi, but the, the English, uh, the, the Turkish speaker, the elderly person didn't understand what I was saying mm -hmm. because that word probably was not, didn't exist in the 50s, 60s when they arrived here and they referred to it as shops, shop, straight mm -hmm. English. So right. when I realized that they didn't understand what I was saying, I was like, oh, okay, let me just try this. So I said, I, I, I said my sentence in Turkish and I said, shopa gitmek, shopa gitmek, mm. going to the shops is also exercise. And then they mm. understood what I was saying. Yes. So, you know, I, I achieved the outcome, okay. but yes. it was probably against against any kind of training. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I think this is also exactly happening in Hong Kong because, you know, Hong Kong basically is... Um, we always say it's a bilingual society. We have Chinese and English, both are the official languages in Hong Kong. And um, the interesting thing is that people in Hong Kong, they are so used to mixing these two languages together when they express themselves. For example, mm -hmm. when they maybe talk about things, let's say, first of all, in Chinese, in Cantonese more specifically, uh, my, my students in university, they will say something like, um, uh, maybe let me give you a very simple Chinese sentence. I'm going to translate it back to fully English. They will say sometimes things like, uh, I first go attend a lecture, then I will attend a tutorial, something like that. Mm, mm. Um, it's quite normal. And, and that's the, normal, yeah? It's not frowned yeah, upon. It's normal. It's, but that it's, it's not like, oh, you're, very normal. You're, you're butchering the language. No one says something like that. Yeah, because it's, on the other end around, you will find it's, it's very abnormal to say that uh, I also need to think about that, you see, as a... <laughs> What's the Chinese equivalent for lecture? Would be I think that we won't we all use Sang Tong because Sang Tong means we have a class. Lecture mm -hmm. would be more like a Dai for big lessons. I don't know how do you translate okay. it. And then and then tutorial will say something like will say something like Do So again, both terms are very in, unfamiliar. Just the same case that you talk about the granny, but this time it's not the granny don't understand about that. It's the it's the kids, not kids. And actually, my students don't understand about that. And I mean, this is just one of the examples that... Is it a generational we, thing? It's not uh, a generational thing, I think. I mean, all generations, university students don't know how to say that in proper, in proper okay, scenes. Yeah, because good. this example actually is cited around in 1970-somethings in one of the mm. academic paper. They first study university students mixing language patterns, which they mm -hmm. call uh, Yu Geiwa, University Talk, they translate it as. Uh, and then yeah. basically during the 1970s, only elites get to mm. the university during that time. But then they right. still speak like that. And it has been documented during that time, they have been speaking like that. And even until today, we are still so using the English, same hmm. Half English, half Cantonese yeah. is is a luxurious thing, is it? It's, it's like an elite. It's the language the elite used. But but the thing is, I don't think any of them are very conscious that they are actually speaking English when they speak. Mm. That. They sometimes will feel like, I mean, sometimes social linguists or people will say that, oh, maybe they are just borrowing some terms, they are loan words, instead of thinking that I'm mixing in English. Mm. Because um, well, it's how, how, do you, how do you differentiate? You know, how, what's the difference between borrowing a word on, and translanguaging? Um, 
So um, basically, again, it's a perspective thing that I would say they can be both the same because even if you look at the, if you look at the classical way of differentiating translanguaging and code mixing or code switching or borrowing, basically they are not saying that they are different. They can be the same. But then the perspective is that when you look at language A mixing, language B or code mixing or code switching, your focus is on the language. And one of the issues about these things is when you try to study from a language center perspective, most of these scholars will suggest that you need to first identify who's the dominant language that mixing with the less dominant language because they are mm. trying to predict mm. who's influencing the others more. So there must be someone that is a stem, but that they must be playing a more important role. But then translanguaging actually don't care and don't need to know who's the more important thing, more the important playing role in the language because the focus is not on the language itself, it's on the process, how they make this, who's the speaker, the whole thing. So um, why do we look at that? Because one of the interesting things about the past literature, when they study language mixing studies, they always say that, well, most cases of language mixings are clear to see which one they mix to which one. Let's say, for example, previously, the examples was, I mix some English words into a Chinese sentence. So Chinese mm -hmm. is the main thing. But sometimes it's actually unclear which one is mixing with which one. And then that causes a problem for traditional linguists because they need to know which one is mixing with which one. But translanguage, they, 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 they need... just have to, they have to know which one yeah, is what. Yeah, yeah. And, because and you're saying, you're saying get over it, break those up. barriers. Don't, fo don't focus on the language, focus on the process. Yeah. In, in our case, simply because who cares, okay, in this case. Because what well, we care is it indeed happened and it is indeed working perfectly well, even though we don't look at which one. Max, do, do, do linguists come up and say, how dare you say, don't care? You know, we um, don't care. <laughs> do, do you make some enemies amongst the linguists? What happens? Well, well I think um, it, it, it's, the, uh, it, it's the perspective thing. Um, so to me, I think one thing uh, translanguaging stands out is because it has this playfulness in it, we uh, it's, it's, it's ju not just simply mixing languages. For example, you, you replace um, the supermarket with the shop in, in uh, Turkish, mm, and, mm. between Turkish and English. Uh, but in most of the cases, people using um, these languages, they combine them to make, uh, to, to create some a humorous effect or maybe to, uh, criticize something to um, um, uh, create to, to attract attentions right so uh, so that people can use this kind of translanguage practice uh, for some other activities for example if they can they can print these uh, languages on a t-shirt and make it a commodity and make money or to um, uh, create a shop sign that everybody can take a photo with and uh, put it on the internet and became the top uh, topic of the day and make their shop uh, famous. So uh, breaking the cycle, getting people out of their comfort zone. Hmm. Right. And, and, and I think it's it also a, a, a sign of um, th um, this kind of translanguaging become mature. And people use this de um, deliberately use this kind of practice to achieve something else. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your research projects. Um, you, you, you had a wonderful presentation at ISB fourteen, um, okay. and okay. Nick, let's let's talk about yours, and then we'll come to yours, Max, and then we'll, we'll okay. talk about how you how you met, how how this friendship began, and mm. you know you come from different backgrounds. One's from translation interpreting, the other one's from English language teaching, mm. and then your paths cross through translanguaging. Mm. Um, yeah, Nick. So, how did your journey start with this, and uh, what what triggered you to go? Hang on, I'm going to dwell into this rabbit hole of translanguaging. I think. Um... I first started it as a um, study of Hong Kong English indeed, which I started the whole project actually in 2014 and 15, which I originally was studying people using English in Hong Kong. So I was studying Hong Kong English because I sometimes noticing that people are using English, which somehow behave like Chinese sometimes. So I was seeing it 
from an English perspective that there is some kind of very Hong Kong kind English, which I noticed the, in 2014 everyone, and 15. Does, does it, yeah. Is everyone fluent in English in Hong Kong? Everyone the, is trained with English in Hong Kong because we have a compulsory education until secondary schools.、So、I would not say everyone is fluent, but interestingly, even though they're not fluent, we're so used to use English to communicate because um. One thing, let's say, differentiate. Let's say Hong Kong, China, Taiwan, Macau, which are all within a slightly different education system. But the Chinese has the main thing is that people in Hong Kong are very used to talk in Chinese but write in English. Oh wow! Write、okay. informally and formally. So that means formally in work communication, we use English, even though everyone in the company only knows Chinese. And then we just text to the girl that we like, even though the girl maybe is a Chinese girl. We speak to her in Cantonese most of the time when we try to flirt face to face. We text in English. Why so, is that? It's a very Hong Kong thing, and that's that's why that's what makes me wanted to study because when we text to each other, actually the English is not so standard. It's English mixing with some Chinese ness of it. So that started the whole thing, which I call a Hong Kong English project. But then in two thousand fifteen, because I had some difficulties, that I wanted to collect more data. But then it's very difficult to collect these kind of data from some public spaces. So I decided maybe instead of collecting some data available outside, why don't I try to start a place that I can get my own data? So I start my own Facebook page during that time because Facebook was quite popular in 2015, and everyone was starting their own page. So I started a page, which I wanted to originally really just to collect data. But then I had a first difficulty is that I I was thinking because naming is very important. So I was thinking, should I use Hong Kong English as the name or should I use Chinglish? Because that was the two main terms that are available during that time. If I write Hong Kong English, it's a bit academic and people may not understand what exactly it is. Chinglish, yeah, they know that, but then it seems a bit negative during that time. So I wanted to have a word that is not so negative, but that represents the things that I want them to speak. So I did two things. First, I come up with a name, which in two thousand fifteen August I came up with a name that's called Kongish K O N G I S H without L. By the way, I'll talk about that later on. And then second thing is with that because I need to make sure people know what exactly it is. So I try to write and mimic a news report because I create a page called Kongish Daily. It's pretending as like. Like you know the daily or the, like the newspaper thing. Yeah,、so、I yeah. try to rewrite a newspaper.、And、were you posting daily as well? Originally, <laughs> <laughs> only only for the first month. I end up too Because, lazy and did it in. You know, I, I think you turned into a little bit of an overnight internet sensation, and it、mm-hmm. was even much harder back then. I mean, these days through TikTok and Instagram, it's pretty easy, I guess. But、um, you know, your page, you went, you created your page, you went to bed, you woke up, and then all of a sudden you had fifteen thousand people. Um, yeah. Following you the next day,、so、yeah, that's did very. Did you feel like some responsibility? Oh my god, what have I done? <laughs> did I did I, did I talk about some wrong persons? No, I didn't. So I think that the interesting thing was showing that during that time, no one knows what Kongish before that day. They know they using that, but no one know this term. So that term、mm. all of a sudden get popular sometimes. And then the thing is, you know, as as everyone plays social medias. Even though you like or you share the post, it doesn't mean you really like it because during that time you didn't have、uh, angry or love that kind of buttons. You only got like、mm, or not like that's during right, that time. That's right. So、um, it doesn't have to be they really like it. But what shows that they like it is they not just like the post, they choose to subscribe、mm. and see more. And they were expecting the next post and the next next post. They seems to be very. Excited to see things like that because of the playfulness of the creativity behind the post, and they were sharing their experiences as well. They were also the interesting thing is they were sharing the experiences in Kongish in the way that normally how we text our friends in the English mixing Chinese nature over there. So、uh, that's how the whole thing began and become part of my PhD project, and then also helped me to get my PhD. Hmm. Well, I should be calling you Doctor Nick Wong. Then, am I right? Not yet. Not yet. Soon,、right. I think. Technically, yes. Not yet. Soon.、Now. Yeah. Uh, look. Um, I still need let's, my let's, let's, vice let's chancellor to poke my head. Future prediction.、Hmm. Uh, future Doctor Nick Wong here.、Yeah. Hmm. Um. And and Max, uh, you're、yeah. doing your PhD as well. So you're you're a future doctor、yes. too. Um. What's your research on? Um. So, originally, I 
don't know this term translanguaging, but I noticed something in the street. You sound like me three Hong months Kong. ago. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I I I noticed this shop sign, um, which I I I couldn't understand at, in in the first sight. Um, so it says Wang Po Jiu Zhou. So it's in it it, it is written in English uh, characters and. Wong is a very common surname in Hong Kong, and Po, it can refer to some Chinese characters, P O, and Jill and Joe are just two common English names. Um, so after a bit of thinking, then I realized it's uh, the Cantonese, um, which means uh, this shop is for lease. All right, so. How long、and、did it that, take you to figure that out?、Uh, seconds, yeah. Sec seconds, seconds, seconds.、Yeah. But it really did make you thinking, right? And this this shop is located in、uh, central Hong Kong. It's the financial hub center, um, uh, center of the CBD area. Um, so this is the my my first encounter with translanguaging. And now I I I see, uh, this kind of practice can be coined as translanguaging. Then and once once you see it, you can't unsee it. I guess it's everywhere, right? Right, right. I I I start to uh walk around the street and 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 trying to capture all these stop signs. And、um, uh, this is my first encounter. That's that was five years ago in twenty eighteen, right? But um, this shop sign. Has been there for more than、uh, seven or eight years. I think、uh, Nick's、uh, mm. Facebook Facebook page also included this、uh, shop sign as early as twenty sixteen or something.、Um, so this is my first encounter with translanguaging, and I got this、uh, term translanguaging from my supervisor at、um, Hong Kong University, and then.、Um, I further looked into this term, and started to realize, like you said,、um, there's a lot of first language around us in our shop signs on T-shirts. So that's how I started、um, this research because I I want to know why people play with with the words and what kind of effect they want to achieve. So. What what does、yeah. Wang Po Jiu Jiu mean? For lease, for lease. For lease. And,、uh, can can you break Wang... it down for me, word for word? Yes. Which one yes. Means,、uh, um, Wang Po means、uh, this is a very popular shop. We have a lot of traffic in front of the shop, and Jiu Jiu means for lease, right? Okay, popular、uh, popular shop, busy shop for lease. Busy for busy shop for lease, right?、Um, Uh, of course, we have another、uh, very famous uh, saying: uh, "Delay no more." <laughs> yeah, I saw, I saw the T-shirt. I saw the T-shirt、yeah. for that. It's not a T-shirt.、Uh, it's、uh, it can be a very how to say encouraging saying、like、in English. It's like a keep calm and do this T-shirt. Yes,、know? do、yeah. not procrastinate and start doing your thing. Right, but.、Um, In Cantonese, you know the meaning. It, you know the meaning it, of delay no it, more. It, but it, delay no more. It's it's obviously you know, like it's written in English, but it's phonetically spelled out, right? So yes, it's, it's, it's phonetically.、Uh, what does、uh, it mean it, in What does it mean in Cantonese? It, it, Are we so, allowed to say that out? <laughs> well, it, I don't know. You tell me. What does it mean? <laughs> it's it's foul, foul language. Right. Foul language. All right. Yeah. We'll, we'll, I'll put a little beep there because you might have kids <laughs> watching this podcast. You know. <laughs> I make sure、uh, kids block your ears. Okay, so it's it, it's it's cursing, is it?、Mm. Yes, it's cursing. Delay no more. All right. Yeah.、Um, I'm not the one that's saying it. You are the one that's saying that. Okay. Basically, it's like F, your mother. Fantastic finding. You know the F, famous F word, not the two that I mentioned.、Hmm. Okay. Wonderful. All right.、Mm. Well, there you go. Is that what that's、oh. what? Delay... And so I can wear that delay no more T-shirt.、Um, And, and and do do you have people who wear it and they don't know what it is? Oh, I got one. You got one. I got <laughs> one. Have you got one, Max? No, I I, I don't. <laughs> But I think I'm、um, I think I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna order one. Yeah, 
<laughs> that's a great idea, but um, of course they they have a lot of other uh, similar T-shirts. Uh, so so in this case, it serves as a fanatic euphemism for mm. for um, the the cursing, but uh, well, people make fun of it, mm. and um, I think this shop sometimes they they, they really targeted the the foreigners in in hong kong and yeah, i actually got it, in the shop that you are researching on i think it's the same shop because you're yes, researching yes, on yes. god right yes yes very famous so, shop in hong kong um, yes some some cultures we might say they could be a little bit more protective of their language you know mm-hmm. they probably might not be keen on too many external language words coming in there mm. and you know bastardizing that language and whatever but i think um in in in, in hong oh, kong sorry bless you in hong kong um it's it's like it's embraced everyone loves it it's it's mm-hmm. like an evolution is there anyone saying oh you know this whole kongish thing and everyone writing in english and speaking in cantonese this is ruining our culture this is ruining our language is is, is does anyone say these things or it's just everyone's open to this kind of thing of course, there are people that would say that as well. But I think um, some scholars actually did some research that they have been to did it around 2014 and 15. Because uh, during that time, actually, Hong Kong was um, first facing the very first big kind of uh, protest about democracies in, in Hong Kong, something like mm. that. So um, there happens to be uh, professors from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, which is called Professor Hanson Edwards. She did a study that to find accidental, I think, well, not accidentally, that she finds out that people before the protests in 2014, Umbrella Revolutions, and after the protests, there seems to be a rise of using that kind of very Hong kong English, which during that time, she also connected to Kongish as well. She thinks that Kongish is also a kind of Hong Kong English during that time. And then what she notices that it seems to be because the... Um, the social political environment during that time favor very uh, local this kind of use of language practice. Mm-hmm. But before that, it was seems to be less likely because they, she happens to have a survey that did some language survey before that and after that period and with, with the same group size and she discovered that. It's an interesting thing that it seems to be related to the social political changes with whether people welcoming the use of these kind of very local kind of language practice mm. yes. so this, this is another feature it can uh you know code mix, mix in not necessarily can bring out one person's identity but as language in uh, obviously they can and it, it, it's very um obvious if you say did they know more or some other uh trans language in, then you are probably uh have been to Hong Kong or stayed in Hong Kong for a period of time, and you know the Cantonese, a bit of Cantonese or English, and you know their culture. So uh, this is another, uh, I think, feature for for translanguaging. And uh, to if you we we come back to uh, that company uh, who which sells this T-shirt, um, there used to be a very um large reaction because they put this instead of delay no more they 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 wrote delay no more m a l l because they have a shop so okay. in a very busy street in uh Causeway Bay, Causeway Bay. Uh, so yeah. yeah business area and next to this shop there's a very famous high school and uh the, the, their parents, the, the students' parents, uh, went crazy because they say, "How can you uh, put this foul language?" Or even though mm-hmm. it's a euphemism, but how can you put this language uh, in such a busy street? So there, there was this. Um, but it's in English, so it only means delay no more, right? But everyone knows two languages in Hong Kong, and what <laughs> also makes it to, to help you to know a little bit more about that shops. I think I think Max may also remember. Uh, on the on the shopping window, they actually have three toilet bowls in front of the to- in front of the shop. So basically, you can walk to in front of the of the shopping window inside the shop and try to look at things. But people behind the shopping window will see that as if like you are 
you are um, standing in front of a uh, toilet bowls because it was a sticker sticking on the on the glass. Ah, you, get what I mean. you didn't so, you didn't know that you were wandering around in a toilet. So when you step you inside to look mm. check out things, people from on the streets will see that as if like, wow, you're like peeing in the public <laughs> at, at the same time. Mm. But uh, I mean that that's the kind of style that you can imagine for that shop. Of course. The they know that shopping mall mall is that is also why they are so playful during that time. I think sounds like fun being on the busy streets in Hong Kong. Yeah, <laughs> everyone can have a chance to pee in front of everyone. <laughs> I've seen I've seen the open air urinals in mm. uh, in London, so uh, you uh, know it's 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 nothing new. Um, yeah, uh, I tried find, I've tried one in in um, in Netherlands. They, they also have that. Yeah, how did you feel about that? The open uh, exposed. <laughs> <laughs> and exposed. how did you two meet? Like two different, you know, sides of language, and then your paths cross. Thanks because... to his supervisor, because basically how I started translating. Who, who language... match made you? Because My of supervisor, I think. supervisor, I think, because his supervisor actually works very closely with the one that I, I get translanguaging from. I get translanguaging from uh, Professor Lee Wai, which is the dean of, of IOE in UCL. So um, he actually worked very closely with Professor Lee, TK Lee in Hong Kong U, and wrote a lot of things. So that's why when I first met Professor Lee Wai in Hong Kong in his talk, he introduced me this concept where we had some private conversations as well because he accidentally cited my work on on Kongish day which i didn't know he didn't know me as well during that time so we started a <laughs> conversation and i started to use that and then max can talk about how we met in hong kong i think we met in hong kong the very first time it was exactly your because of your supervisor max do you remember the first time you met nick but i can assure you that it's not romantic at all uh uh oh, that's disappointing <laughs> It was in uh, 2018 or 19. Mm. Uh, mm. There was a uh, there was a conference, conference. Uh, held at Hong Kong U. Yeah. And um, but I think I'm not. I, I was not talking about trans language at the time. But because your supervisors, because your topic was quite similar to to studying protest languages during that time. Oh, right, right, right. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm. So um, yeah. So so it's a uh, it has a bit relationship with with trans trans I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's how we first met, and also we we I I, I met um, Nick as well as Pedro, uh, mm. who is also a, a administrator of Congress Daily. Right? The Facebook page. Yeah. So is is the Facebook page still alive? Is it still yeah. going? Yeah, yes. Still yes. going. And it's still on Facebook, even though Facebook, you know, has gone the way of dinosaurs almost. And, <laughs> you know, I recently had to switch to Instagram as well because I, I was told that, you know, yeah, it's still it's, around. It's Facebook is taken over by mothers things. and grandmothers and grandparents, so mm. which is fine, you know. I still need to entertain grandparents, so. grandparents, okay? <laughs> um, to eat. Absolutely. So, are you? Are you? Have you got an Instagram and a TikTok page as well? Or are you just still rock and rolling on Facebook? <laughs> Still, I actually have um IG Instagram um not that with not that many followers. I think five, six, seven thousand followers. I can't remember. Oh wow, hmm. not that many. He says. <laughs> oh well, there you go, Mister Internet Sensation. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, your time in Sydney. I mean, like I said, we had a we had a pretty pretty good gala dinner together. Um, that was that was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. Was this your first time in Australia? First time for me. Nick, first time for you. Max? Yes, my, I think, second time. Uh, the first oh, you're, time you're, was... You're a regular. See, <laughs> hello. This, uh, last time was uh, just uh, traveling in uh, Melbourne and Tasmania. Uh, but this time... But uh, it was my first time in Sydney. Uh, very exciting city. But after the conference, I went to Perth. To meet those. That's a podcasts. long flight. Yes, to me. Where did you go in Perth? Four or five hours. Um, it's quite a long flight. So, 
I go to that rock, um, rock nest rock, island. Rock nest island, yes, yeah. and to meet those little creatures. Uh, yeah. so there's a pro tip. Uh, meeting those quokas, you need to go to that island uh, island uh, very early. Uh, you you need to take the, uh, I think seven o'clock ship. Um, the cruise to the ship uh, to the island, and then, uh, you will have ch uh, a lot of chance to take photos with them, very intimate photos with them. They can eat uh, leaves or nuts in front of you, uh, but um, they they they're very smiley creatures, aren't they? Yes, they are very smiley. I wonder, if, not... I wonder if they're actually smiling or it's just you know they're built that way, and they might be going <laughs> not another bloody human being taking a photo of me. <laughs> But they're yeah, doing actually, it with a great smile because they, they don't know anything else. <laughs> their, their face muscles are built that way. <laughs> yeah, they, 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 uh, yeah, they look uh, um, smiling because they are chewing the leaves. Ah. And because of the angle, you, you, you took those photos. Uh, uh, but um, you You're ruining yeah. it for me now. I thought, just, just, I just, I thought they just smiled all the time. <laughs> but who knows? Maybe in reality, they are very... Miserable and sad, maybe. And then, <laughs> not, 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 not likely because they they go to sleep in during the noon. They they go to sleep very uh, very early. So uh, that's why you need to go there early. And Nick, uh, did you get up to anything when you were here? Basically, I think um, I didn't quite manage to. Did Did you, did you walk you know, around looking about... at shop signs? No, because one thing one thing that you notice, I think you may not have noticed because you 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 are actually only. In Australia, shop closed too early for me. You know, the moment oh, that yeah, the conference yeah, I... has ended, basically, I only got the restaurants left that I can go and visit. Yeah. So that makes me a little bit difficult to to experience. But one thing that I've noticed quite interestingly is that it's very Hong Kong and not so Hong Kong. Sometimes the very Hong Kong is sometimes all of a sudden, how come I hear people speaking, looking at like you know kids speaking Cantonese and then speaking English? Just feel like the moment that oh, they are actually. They actually feel like making me feel like I'm in Hong Kong. But then after listening carefully, the way that how they mix the language is different. Mm. Kids in Hong Kong ah, don't speak like It's so another different like kind of Kongish. Yeah. It's an yeah. Oz Kongish. Ogish, or maybe it's Ogish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I love it. See, there's there's another research project right there for you. Mm. Um, mm. You stayed in Chatswood? Yeah. You know, there, big shopping malls, basically. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think there were, there were a lot of um, there's a big Asian community there or, or a Chinese community. Yeah. So um, you know you would have had the chance to I guess observe. Uh, if how... it's not in Macquarie, maybe I would stay more in the city center. But it's in Macquarie, is basically <laughs> forcing me to stay along the line to make sure it's not yeah, too far. Chats, Chatswood was a was a wonderful area as well. Mm, I've yeah, never indeed. been there, and it was like a, another second city center. I was, mm. I was very mm. positively surprised. Um, and, and there were a lot of, um, I guess, uh, Chinese shops around there as well. Uh, when I was saying earlier, you know, did, did you study the signage here um, within those, maybe within the Chinese shops, if they were mixing English with either Mandarin or Cantonese, or were you too busy just... Um, yes, with... I actually took some photos of some shop signs. I. I... Um, so one thing I like like to do when I visit other countries is that I like to go to the Chinatown mm. and took um, uh, some photos of, of, of some shops. Um, and this time I, I took some photos of uh, a Chinese restaurant, but it's, it was run by, uh, it was not run by Chinese people. Uh, so one feature uh, of that ch Chinese shop shop sign is that um, people prefer to use some certain kind of font. Oh, I was also about shop to say that. Yeah. Mm. So it was called, uh, after I did some research, it's, I think it's called Chinatown font. So they are mimicking the uh, uh, brush, uh, but you are using those brush strokes to write, write English. English. To yes. write in English? Which is quite yes. quite strange to us because, um, I mean, for me, I don't feel these are the common practice that I normally see in Hong Kong. That's why that's the moment that I also say it's not so Hong Kong. 
because mm-hmm. I see bilingual signs, but then the way that how it is being presented visually or, or, or on the font's design is very mm-hmm. not like what I see in Hong Kong. Hmm. Yes, yes. And so, uh, so that's why people, uh, well, well, some people think that this kind of font is a, a kind of racism, but um, uh, it, it, it is very widely used. Uh, well, in... Racism via font. So yeah, the, so so people are asking, kind of font it's like be appro- appropriation resist? of a Chinese font and then making it English, is it like right? So or, or stereotyping, uh, yes, stereotyping mm. uh, kind of culture of Chinese culture. Uh, but I uh, didn't look deep into that. But um, I think it's always good. At least you need to um, record what is out there, and maybe. Uh, we can come back and uh, study it more. Well, it just, you know, I've got, I've got two gentlemen from Hong Kong here and we can probably talk for days about this and then imagine with hundreds of, maybe thousands of different cultures, hundreds of mm-hmm. other languages, translanguaging between those languages and, and those cultures, even within languages themselves, they'll be translanguaging between dialects as well, I guess. Um, it's It's just an, endless endless world uh where do you think that this is going to take you nick um are you now going to be you know mr translanguaging mr kongish um how do you plan to impact the industry where does this research take you and then where does where do you see yourself within um, i think the your, next thing academic life yeah i think the next thing actually is similar as like what max has been doing because we have been actually focusing very much on just how language A, B, C, D are fully utilizing together, or A, B, C, or A, B, we are talking about language and language kind of mixing and fully utilization of that. But then we are actually capable to see beyond language and language. So that means we can start looking at maybe how semiotics, you talk about that at the beginning, like if we use presents, maybe body gestures, or maybe even like photos, even colors, even other things, I think, there are actually a lot more that we can explore because um, actually I really like Max project. I know this is about the end, but one thing that we can see is sometimes even the choice of colors red can make a very different impact of the message because there are different mm. kind of red. There are red mm. red, of course. There are also China red that is a bit darkish kind of red. So that would also make the message very different. It's not to say the fonts and also not to say the choice of uh integrating these elements together in a clever way. So I think that in the future, we are definitely no longer just seeing how language is being used smartly by integrating another language. We're talking about also integrating with many other semiotic and other many elements that to make effective communications. Hmm. Yeah, and and Max, what about you? I I understand it much better than I did, honestly. before those few glasses of wines and you, you explained to me, uh, you know, the, you can, you can really utilize this in, in many aspects of everyday mm-hmm. life. Um, you know, everything from communication to marketing. Uh, and I, I can definitely see um, a, a lot of potential uh, for translanguaging to be, it, it's probably being used without us even knowing. Um, yes. It's just a, it's just a matter of realizing or not. Um, and and Max, where do you, Max, where do you see your research taking you, and what's what are the next steps for you? Well, I think um, because I'm I'm uh, still working on my project, but um, I think the meaning of studying uh, translanguaging in Hong Kong is uh, we can know better about Hong Kong and where does all this trans language and come from because well, 150 years ago, uh, Hong Kong is nothing like this. Uh, but uh, throughout the years with the uh, communication and also transportation uh, with different countries and different rulers who have um, mm. uh, we've been a, a colonial uh, for a hundred more than a hundred a uh, hundred eight years um and I believe all these things are connected and because that's why uh people accept English and use English in their daily life and uh, or even create something new um and when this 
uh, practice becomes more mature, then people start to play with it and to commodify it. And then this is another way to push Hong Kong to uh, to the world, right? It's, it's um, no longer, we, we, we are no longer um, uh, only use uh, this place as a, as a hub, as a, uh, only doing business here, but um, we created this kind of culture. It's, it's very unique in Hong Kong. Mm. So we, we, we can u- utilize this uh, translanguaging to show the world that we have um, another side. Right? Is there a conference there coming up soon so I can make an excuse to get my boss to fly me there and see Hong Kong, see this wonderful, <laughs> beautiful, beautiful city that you're talking about? I was about yeah, to so. the other way around. I was coming to Perth. I think I think we might be coming to Perth. I don't know. We haven't been accepted yet, right, Max? What's happening in Perth? Uh, uh, is there a Quokka conference? And <laughs> there is another new conference. I think in in Perth that we would be attending if we got accepted. So um, in the summer again. So we uh, winter for you. <laughs> Well, it's uh, it's always nice and warm in mm. Perth most of the time anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, do keep me posted. It'll be great if we could catch up again. Um, yes. And, and, and maybe you might even drop into Melbourne. I'll take you to Chinatown here and you can take some photos of the yeah. shops. That's great. That's great. Right. We'll, come, we'll come to Hong Kong too if you, if you have Absolutely. time. Absolutely. I'm going I'm to do everything I can to get there and study translanguaging in the streets. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely take you around. And um, you race with any good. time. Mm. Just I can't bit. wait. And uh, look, future doctors, Nick Wong and Max Lee uh, from Hong Kong, thank you so much for your time today. Um, look, we could we could talk on for hours, like I said, uh, but maybe we'll, we'll touch base again towards the end of your research and see some results, outcomes. Um, Nick, I know that uh, you've completed your PhD and now it's just waiting to be stamped and you're waiting for, the, for your hat. Mm. Uh, so congratulations. Um, and much. Max, you know, a, a few more thousands of words for you still. Uh, yeah. to write um so so good luck good luck with that i could you know I, I contemplated doing a phd i'm like wow that is that is some dedication so kudos to the both of you and good luck with thank everything you. and i thank you thank you so much for coming on to conversations interpreting and translating podcast thank you for the advice again thank you thank, thank you. you take care and you too um thank you uh, viewers listeners uh that was max lee and nick wong and we we attempted talking about translanguaging. They knew what they were talking about. Um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very, very new learner on this. Uh, so please don't forget to subscribe and like. Is that right, Nick? Here, there, yeah. there, there. <laughs> we have one, trans, one last translanguaging practice. We call it CLS. Comments, like, subscribe. But in Cantonese, CLS also means another vowel language word, which means allow me to say one last time because it's an English channel. It's called Qi Lan Xin, which means that it's come. It's, which is Are you swearing at crazy, people now? Crazy person, that means something like that. But, but remember the C L S. C L S. And I'm not calling you a crazy person. I'm just no. saying comment, like, subscribe. All right. All right. Well done. And um, we'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Conversations Podcast.